All right, uh, greetings everyone. This is parallel session number two, and I'm delighted to have you all here. And we are, we are, um, we have a great session here today. And so, and as I mentioned earlier in, in the session, and we, we have parallel sessions going on here. So now people are going to either session here, but then why don't we go ahead and start with session number two, because I don't want to take time from the, from the keynote speakers here. We will start the session with Professor Anlia Pastram, founder and CEO of Smartening Social Entrepreneurship on the SDGs. She's a very dear friend of mine and uh, one of the originators of the global MSME report and um, that we do ICSB does every year. And her topic is very key. We mentioned it in the session before about sustainability, but her specific topic is the SDG 12 and sustainable entrepreneurship. And Analia, um, we're delighted to see you here and then um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ayman El Taravishi. It's a real pleasure for me to be with you and the distinguished speakers that it are with me today. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Um, and I will do it as well. Okay. So Smartly is a social enterprise that is working. Uh, through the whole region, Latin America to the world. And we are book partners of the World Urban Campaign of UN Habitat, that is a huge platform that is uh, localizing the sustainable development goals from the cities. And in this uh, platform, we, we are part of the, in, in my case, my name, uh, we are part of the steering committee so we are working with different organizations and different partners and, uh, around the globe um, with, of course, with ICSB mainly. And why I would like to start from here, because right now we have two ch huge challenges ahead uh, in front of us, the climate uh, change crisis, as well as the, um, this COVID, this pandemic. Um, so the solution it has to be from, uh, SDG 17 with partnerships, working all together. And this conference, especially this day, is a, a, an excellent uh, opportunity for all of us to think and rethink how we would like to start um, this re re thinking, how we are going to build back better this world. Um, we have in front of us a, an emergency, um, so we need to act with, um, with a huge responsibility, uh, specifically our generations, we have in front of us the, the, the responsibility of, of doing the changes that the world needs, uh, and especially for our next generations. So I would like to invite you all to think um, what was our normal life that we were used to, and what are the challenges that we have uh, to think a way forward. Right now with this COVID-19 situation, we have the opportunity to think uh, what kind of cities, what, what kind of communities, what kind of jobs, what kind of entrepreneurship we need for this world. And I would like to focus uh, starting uh, from SDG5, uh, from gender equality as well, because we need to think in cities and in businesses lead by um, women as well. Um, and I would like to emphasize this because women, we have a, well, a huge connection as well with the nature, mother nature, and we are very, um, all the time thinking regarding sustainability, of how can we build better communities for everyone. Uh, recently, we have a, a study from UNTAD office regarding what, what is happening with the uh, funding, the financing uh, to the SDGs. And unfortunately, we, we, we have in front of us this, uh, well, these numbers that are uh, shocking uh, because we have less funding and uh, financing in infrastructure, in health, in washing, uh, and, and that these numbers is showing us that uh, leaders, they think that they need to cover first the COVID-19 emergency, but unfortunately they are not thinking in what is happening next, what is happening when the 
uh, with the economies and the recovery that we need in long term. So these numbers I would like to share with you are really um, impressive regarding this, how uh, the governments and the organizations are investing, um, trying to solve the COVID-19 situation, but unfortunately they are not thinking and building back better. So that's something that we need to focus uh, and UNTA is showing us uh, this, numbers to to pay attention and to think how we can uh, do it in a different way. So as I used to say, um, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are like hashtags for, for public policy. They are giving us the opportunity to connect all the, the things and problems that we are used to, like poverty, hunger, but with a new language, with a new approach. And this is a huge opportunity for us to connect all the organizations, all the efforts um, to work together uh, to get a better quality education. For example, if, I'm uni if you are a professor or part of the university and you are working in quality education, you are working on SDG4. So if you are communicating that, you will get a huge uh, opportunities, amount of opportunities with different organizations and universities around the globe. Thinking in transnationally, uh, transnational um, policies and all the opportunities that we have regarding globalization, um, I think that is something that we need to keep in mind. As I said, um, we have a, a program regarding Women 2030. And what is the, the, the leadership position that as women we need to have uh, to transform this world and to uh, create a sustainable future uh, for all of us. And that's, this is really connected because usually when you think uh, on sustainability, you don't think that what is the role of all the SDGs because sustainability is, uh, is a part of a thing, but the Sustainable Development Goals is uh, thinking in a holistic way and uh, in a way that you are connecting gender equality, uh, quality education, um, among others, uh, life and resilience and uh, peace and strong institutions. So uh, we would like to work and we are working in the region uh, promoting women to achieve a sustainable career to get a sustainable um, career and development, in spe specifically in those leadership positions that usually women, when they are getting a, a, a leadership position, they, are, they feel alone. So we would like to make and boost a, this platform to connect each other. So um, one of the challenges that we have in front of us is how people is over consuming their resources. And this is, uh, there are different medicines like the global footprint medicine that is um, saying every year that the footprint uh, and as all the human beings, we are over consuming the resources of mother earth. And plastic, specifically the use, the single use of plastic is the, the, the huge problem in front of us. So right now, we, we would like, and we have been working from the International Council for Small Business regarding yeah. this, uh, how to connect social entrepreneurship with sustainable entrepreneurship and this new way of doing businesses. So it's thinking your idea of, this, of business in doing it in a sustainable and eco-friendly way through the whole process, not only in the, taking an account of what kind of raw materials do you need, but specifically what kind of packaging do you need? Uh, it's going to be um, affordable, it's going to be uh, eco-friendly with the ecosystem. Uh, what is the impact that the whole uh, uh, entrepreneurship, is, uh, the whole uh, business is doing with the uh, community and the ecosystem as well? So we have a platform with this, uh, with other partners, Directorio Sustentable, there is a huge platform in Latin America that is connected 15,000 of sustainable entrepreneurs um, 
from Mexico to Argentina, Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, um, among uh, other regions, um, we are trying to boost this new way of thinking and this new way of producing in a sustainable way. And this is really connected with the young generations, all the centennials, millennials. Uh, we are trying to think in a way, what is the uh, impact of our way of consuming? And this is amazing how uh, from the entrepreneurial ecosystem, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that are giving us a lot of solutions, trying to re reuse the plastic materials, reuse uh, all the, well, the, the plastic that we have in the environment, but as well as trying to give us solutions uh, with some kind of materials um, that are with the same or similar uh, features like uh, plastic, but are uh, biodegradable and in less than 50 days, they are, um, uh, they, they are not in, in the ecosystem anymore. So that's something that we are trying to boost and connect. And this is something that is not, is happening uh, everywhere. Everywhere, uh, these new generations are thinking in a new way of having a new a, a, a green agenda. And of course, the, the main companies, they're trying to, um, to get this agenda because this, this means that they don't want to lose the market. They don't, let, they don't want to lose clients and opportunities. So we have uh, different examples of huge companies, for like example, Lego. Uh, they are trying to um, to change and adapt, readapt their business model to this new um, mindset. So um, from Smartly, we are working regarding what is the kind of urban legislation and the laws that we need to boost and have to protect this new way of doing businesses. Because you uh, if you have in front of you the idea of being a sustainable entrepreneur, as well, you have also the risk, and unfortunately, you don't have the legal framework to do it properly. This means that sometimes, for example, you want to register your company and you don't have any specific legal framework for this. So we are working in project of laws, of bills, to working with different parliaments of the region to try to, cre to create this legal framework that we, you need to develop your business. This is a huge change in terms of uh, cultural, political, and economical uh, transformation, because I'm not, work not talking only about uh, what is the role of being a so sustainable entrepreneur? I'm talking about also what is the role of politicians? What is the role of parliaments to, to, uh, to create bills and public policies to boost this new wave of doing businesses? So we are working in urban legislation, for example, to protect the entrepreneurial ecosystem with, uh, and specifically we're working in SDG to uh, the SDG second zero hunger, um, protecting the beekeeping and the pollinators because this is really connected with the diverse and variety of food that we need for um, specifically right now that we in front of us, we have uh, as a result of this COVID-19 situation, 41 million people getting in famine, in poverty, in hunger. So, this is something that we are trying to boost with bills and public policies and legislation. Also, another thing that we've been working with different local governments and local parliaments is sustainable tourism. We are trying to think and give the, the, the legal framework of after this COVID-19 situation, what kind of recovery from the tourism we need, but it has to be sustainable. It has to be uh, think, uh, thinking in a way to connect the communities and give it the capacity to, uh, to develop businesses in this eco-friendly way. And also the kind of tourists that we need with a new mindset regarding uh, 
recycling, regarding the, the, the way of using paper in the conferences, in the events, among other things. Well, finally, from the International Council for Small Business with a Smartly, we've been launching this special issue, sustainable entrepreneurship. This is something that we are very, very pleased to, to, to have, uh, an academic tool to work with business schools uh, around the globe with uh, concrete actions and examples of sustainable entrepre entrepreneurs that they are doing a huge effort to, um, well, to readapt their business models, uh, to have more opportunities, and also to tackle this climate change um, situation and crisis that we have in front of us. So I would like to encourage you to all of you to read this special issue and to enter and visit the ICSB website with the journal um, and this effort that we did last year during the, the pandemic as well. And finally, I would like to, I'm ending, uh, to connect all the things and your actions that you're doing like this little one that we have in front of us. Uh, please try to think all the, the things that you're doing, what kind of impact and connection it has with the environment. So thank you so much and I will keep uh, in touch. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. And Alia, thank you very much. An exceptional presentation as well. And as I said to you, and I'll say it again here, is that you are a blazing leader here and that is changing the world. And we support you 100% with all your efforts. Just amazing presentation with all the work that you're doing here. In the other session, we talked about the role of women leaders and, and you're the best example of this. So just an exceptional. One thing I got out of it is that using the SDGs as hashtags, which is very critical here. And with that, I wanna ask you to please continue chatting in the chat. Some people were asking you some questions. But let me switch now to Professor Kirby. And um, I have your slides, I'm gonna show them here. Um, and then I can maneuver your slides, Professor Kirby. And then um, you can tell me to go to the next slide and I'll do that. And then we'll go from there. So the floor is yours, Professor Kirby. Let me make them larger, uh, Eamon. Yes, fine. Thanks, Eamon, and thanks for the invitation. And thank you most sincerely for organizing this event. Um, the whole concept of sustainable entrepreneurship has really you know, been exercising my mind ever since I started in this field. Um, and in Global Entrepreneurship Week last year, I launched what we call the Harmonious Entrepreneurship Society. the importance of sustainability, particularly amongst young people, and you know, trying to change in many ways the curriculum in, uh, in particular in our universities in order to create uh, what we call harmonious enterprises, enterprises that address the sustainability problem. Uh, next slide, Raymond, please. I, anybody that knows me knows that I'm passionate about entrepreneurship and have been uh, ever since um, I, I started out in academia. Um, I, I find it a very powerful tool. Obviously, it's a powerful tool for creating jobs, as David Birch demonstrated in the States in, in 79. It's a powerful tool in, in creating wealth, creating wealth. As Drucker has said, it's, it's the, the attribute of the entrepreneur. Um, you know, it brings about change, brings about improvement, as we were talking in, in the um, uh, earlier session. Uh, but for me also, it's, it's vitally important because it's a, an indicator of people taking ownership, taking responsibility. Um, to my undergraduates are we can no longer rely upon they, whether they are the wealthy countries in the world, whether they're the multinational companies, whether they're government, we can't rely upon they. 
uh, we have to, to begin to take ownership. And I suppose it, you know, it stems from the fact that I'm a, I was a young person, a millennial, I suppose, in the era of Margaret Thatcher and the, the way in which she changed the, the role of the state. Um, it's certainly traditional entrepreneurship brings about change, can bring about improvement, and it, and it tends to address the SDGs 1, 8, 9 and 12. Um, and according to many academics, um, it, it is able to address the sustainability challenge. But the big problem is that it, it tending, is tending not to have done so. Um, I'm fully familiar uh, through my childhood with the ne negative consequences of entrepreneurship, how it destroyed environments how it uh, polluted the atmosphere, polluted um, the, the waterways, uh, how it destroyed human life in many ways. It created jobs, yes. But, you know, talk about humane entrepreneurship. It was the last thing that uh, uh, employers were concerned about. I used to have, um, when, I, when I was a child, I used to have schoolmates who, um, whose parents were killed or maimed in the factories in which they were working. Plus, you know, the, the pollution uh, the, uh, 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 impacted on health. And, you know, we've, we've seen many academics beginning to question is, is sustainability uh, and um, entrepreneurship com compatible? And we've seen people like Schaltiger looking for new business models. Um, you know, the Prince of Wales says we can no longer rely upon um, the, uh, the things that have caused the problems that we're facing today. We've got to look for a new way of, of doing business. So next slide, Eamon, please. I began to think about the reason for this. And I think one of the main problems is that what we touched on in the first session, you know, the, the emphasis on, 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 on wealth. And it stems partly from classical economics that uh, profit is the reward for risk and the entrepreneurs are supposed to be though I tend not to agree with it, uh, risk takers. I think the risk minimizes and, uh, and they do nothing more than take calculated risk. But also um, Friedman in, in 1970, in um, a seminal piece in the New York Times said, responsibility of business is making as much money as possible. Um, I, then, I, I encountered this in the UK. I talked to a director of a leading chemical company and said, I thought he'd been irresponsible. Yeah, they destroyed the environment. They, they, they created the slum conditions for the working workers. Um, they polluted the rivers. And he said, no, my responsibility is to my shareholders. You know, it's not to the environment. It's not to the, the workforce, it's to the shareholders. And, and that, I think, has stemmed from what Friedman said. But if you carry on with what Friedman said, what he also said was, it's about making mo as much money as possible within the laws and ethical customs of society. And if we look at the ethical customs, if we look at religion, all of the major rel religions, terrorism, um, it, you know, is probably the, the, the first one, all take resp uh, responsibility for the environment. The two that I'm most familiar with are Christianity. And if you look in Genesis, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to keep it. So, you know, we, we, we were put on this planet in order to look after it. In Islam, the prophet Muhammad said, the world is green and verdant. And verily God, the exalted, has made us stewards in it. So we, our ethical custom, dating back thousands of years, actually instructs us that we should be caring for the environment, not in its narrow sense, in, in its um, physical sense, but in, in the human environment, as well as the, 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 the physical environment. So next slide, uh, Eamon. We've seen the way in which entrepreneurship has developed. It's developed new forms, it's developed ecopreneurship, it's developed now recently um, with the ICSP, humane entrepreneurship, and it's developed 
uh, social entrepreneurship, all extremely admirable. You know, I, 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 I delight to, to see the developments, but none of them individually addresses sustainability per se. They address social problems, they address humane problems, and they address environmental problems. And traditionally, entrepreneurship has addressed economic problems. And this has led us to, you know, question the compatibility of entrepreneurship with sustainability and uh, encouraged the search for, for new models. Next slide. So we've come up with the concept of harmonious entrepreneurship. And what we led us to that is the fact that the planet is a system and it's, um, composed of interconnected subsystems. Some of those systems are human, some of them are physical, environmental, some of them are e economic, um, technological systems. Um, but what we know is if you address one element of a system, it creates a change elsewhere in the system. It can be detrimental, it can be positive, but we have to recognize the interconnectivity and when we address one problem we have to look at you know the interconnections and the way things change or need to change so we've been using the systems thinking of von Bertalanffy and um, Ashby's law of requisite variety which basically says you know if you have a, um, a problem a complex problem you need as many solutions to that problem as uh, that are causes. And we've also used the harmony principles of the Prince of Wales, um, the har harmony with nature and harmony between people. So the harmonious entrepreneurship uh, approach basically is integrating or harmonizing the four main approaches to entrepreneurship, economic, ego, humane and social. And it's producing um, much more holistic uh, uh, ventures, ventures that create jobs and wealth. There's nothing wrong in creating jobs and wealth, and it's part of the SDGs. It addresses the environmental issues. It addresses the people issues, the social issues, and the humane issues. And the end product is a triple bottom line in accordance with Elkington, uh, planet, people, and profit. So we're not simply interested in making money we're not simply interested in uh, an enterprise that doesn't make money but addresses the social problems and the environmental problems we're interested in creating ventures that address environment people and profit next slide Evan, please and the model that we've built and the inspiration for this thinking is comes out of Egypt. It's um, uh, uh, Seacom Holdings in Egypt, which has about 150 products and five different companies. It employs 2000 people and 3000 farmers. And essentially, this was the idea of Professor Ibrahim Abalesh, a biochemist who um, was educated in Austria, but returned to Egypt and wanted to address the poverty uh, uh, in his country. And he took a, an area of very hostile um, desert land and turned it into a thriving oasis using biodynamic agriculture. But he didn't just do that, he created a sustainable community for the people that worked in his factories. Um, he created um, quality housing, des architect designed housing. He created religious and cultural facilities. He created medical facilities. And importantly, he created schools, colleges and a university a university which is devoted to sustainable development. And in, in so doing, I mean, he, dress, he addressed many, it was before the time of the SDGs, but he addressed many of the 
um, SDGs, um, which we now have. His um, business was awarded the Right Livelihood Award, which is the alternative Nobel Prize. And the, the, the judging panel said that this is the sort of businesses, business model, which is um, or ought to be developed in the 21st century. So it's a very much a holistic business model. It's integrating uh, the, the four separate approaches. It's emphasizing the environment, it's emphasizing the economy, it's en emphasizing uh, human issues and, and, and social issues. Um, Ibrahim Abalesh could not have achieved, and he, he will, he, he won't tell you now, but he told me, I could not have achieved what I did if I hadn't have, um, uh, in terms of um, his business success, if I hadn't have developed the community, the people, educated them and uh, cared for them in terms of uh, their medical requirements. Next slide, Emily, please. And this is the final slide. I'll leave you with the message, which was um, uh, thousands of years ago, uh, Chinese philosopher, all things under the sun will flourish when harmony prevails. Um, we have to get our economy, our society, our people, and, and our environment working together in harmony. And uh, what we've been doing uh, in the Harmonious Entrepreneurship Society over the last six months is basically writing a case study every week, which we publish on our website and uh, in LinkedIn, which demonstrates the feasibility and the, the, the nature of what we're talking about. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, an excellent presentation here. As I mentioned earlier, the topic of harmonious entrepreneurship or harmony is key. Let us continue with the, uh, the third presentation here. Um, third presentation here, Dr. Jeff Hornsby, and the floor is yours. And then we can open up for questions and answers for everybody. Okay. Thanks, Simon. And uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, moving away from sustainable entrepreneurship and get back into the critical elements of humane entrepreneurship. Uh, this talk comes from a paper that is in the, um, the recent special issue on humane entrepreneurship in the Journal of Small Business Management. And I've known uh, Keyshawn and, and heard the concept of humane entrepreneurship for several years now. And my background uh, is not, not only in entrepreneurship, but in human resource management. And I did some work uh, approximately 10 years ago uh, with James Hayton um, out of Warwick University. He was at Newcastle before that uh, in this area of high performance work systems and how that affects the corporate entrepreneurial process. And the, 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 the evolution of uh, what I'm going to talk about really comes out of how do these elements of humane entrepreneurship that Keyshawn talked about in his keynote, empathy, uh, equity, enablement, empowerment, how do they evolve in, in an organization? And then how does that impact other things? Um, and how does that impact the success of corporate entrepreneurship? And hopefully I stir up some questions and really engage you in a challenge about uh, conducting some effective empirical uh, research that supports some of these elements because I think in this area of humane entrepreneurship, we need uh, empirical uh, research support. So, um, you know, the core spirit of entrepreneurship has kind of stayed the same over time, uh, but it has branched out into several areas. We've heard about uh, harmonious entrepreneurship, we've heard about sustainability entrepreneurship, but some of those really fall into two other categories besides actual startup entrepreneurship. And one I would call um, business-centric corporate entrepreneurship, and that's uh, you know entrepreneurship within an organization. And then the human-centric social entrepreneurship, that's the triple bottom line types of ventures uh, and, and other types of organizations that have a more of a social benefit. And you know, a lot of people think that these two things are contradictory. 
but I think the, the model we're going to present here and the concept of humane entrepreneurship actually shows that they work, to use the term harmoniously together, uh, to create this culture um, and this integration of those, those elements of equity, empathy, empowerment, enable, and, and enablement. Uh, so we're gonna call this the human uh, entrepreneurship framework. And it, some of the key concepts or factors are the creation of a high performance work system. I think that's the element, that's the theoretical base that gives humane entrepreneurship its legs. Uh, and also how does that lead to creating an entrepreneur orientation within an organization? Because truly what humane entrepreneurship is, is corporate entrepreneurship uh, in a uh, that that implements uh, work systems that are what Keyshawn calls humane, uh, and so we suggest in order to successfully create and sustain uh, entrepreneurial per performance in an organization, you have to focus on key human resource elements, create a posture for entrepreneur orientation that is built on human and social capital. And the human and social capital that I'm going to talk about is those concepts of humane entrepreneurship that Keyshawn has talked about. Uh, just to give a, a refined definition of humane entrepreneurship, Kim Terabishi and Bay uh, a few years ago redefined uh, humane entrepreneurship as a virtuous and sustainable integration of entrepreneurship, leadership, and human resource management in which successful implementation leads to a beneficial increase in wealth and quality job creation perpetuated in a continuous cycle. So this is, I mean, this really falls in the lap of corporate entrepreneurship and how do you integrate in the challenge of leadership uh, and management support, creating an effective human resource system, then ultimately uh, being successful. Uh, ultimately, uh, we propose a framework that we want to change the corporate culture and establish an engagement between organizations and their employees. Uh, as seen in the next slide in the model we propose in the paper, um, we propose that humane entrepreneurship results from the conditions created by high performance work systems and on, uh, entrepreneur orientation integration. And I'll explain that. Uh, when integrated high performance work systems and EO generate human and social capital uh, and produce an innovative workplace culture based on the elements of humane entrepreneurship, enablement, empowerment, equity, and empathy. Additionally, we suggest that there are organizational antecedents, this is a lot of work I've done with uh, Don Caraco and others, that, uh, that create the culture for innovation and entrepreneurship in the first place. And that's top management support, rewards, time availability, and the removal of barriers. All critical elements uh, to engage in humane entrepreneurship. So here's the model. Just take a, I'm going to walk you through the model and explain some of these elements very quickly here. But uh, it start, there's three major aspects to it. Organizational antecedents. This is a lot of work that I've been involved in over the last 30 years, looking at uh, five key elements that creates uh, a culture that allows you to sustain effective corporate entrepreneurship. And that's top management support, rewards and reinforcement, autonomy, time availability, and organizational boundaries. And if you think about the humane entrepreneurship elements and what Keyshawn said in his keynote, leadership is key. And in our empirical research, the, thing, the, the variable that, that accounts for the most variance in uh, successful corporate entrepreneurship is top management support by far. Uh, the one that creates the most challenge to uh, effective corporate entrepreneurship is rewards and reinforcement, because we need to study and understand better how to reward our corporate entrepreneurs. So that's the antecedents. And then we have this humane entrepreneurship or human entrepreneurship framework of uh, the integration of high performance work systems, uh, especially focusing on knowledge management, things like staffing and training. Comp and, benef comp and incentives, rewards, feedback, communication, then policies and work design. Uh, that these uh, high performance work systems, if developed right, they're, they're, they're person centric, human centric, create human capital and social capital 
that allow for uh, the, the, the firm to behave entrepreneurially. And that then leads to outcomes like incremental and radical innovation, organizational renewal, new product development, external and internal venturing. So well, I'm gonna walk you through this model and I, uh, there's a lot of words on the, on the slides and I'm not gonna uh, cover everything, but uh, if you would like to get a copy of these slides, Iman will have a copy to send out to anybody that requests it, or you can reach out to me uh, personally. Uh, so again, the model reflects the consistent theoretical work uh, in strategic human resource management that has argued that high performance work systems is channeled through human resources. Um, you know, a firm's human, Wicklin and Shepard, two well-known uh, entrepreneurship researchers, also identify human resources as an important element in developing entrepreneurial behaviors. And they, back in 2003, they were one of the first really to uh, uh, study this and suggest the critical nature of focusing on human resources in entrepreneurship. Uh, so not to spend a lot of time on this, could be, you see it in the model, but there's plenty of work uh, published in, in journals talking about these five factors uh, and looking at their empirical relationship to organizational performance and other aspects like entrepreneurial motivation and such. Um, but it is important in, in, when you're trying to implement and make change in your organization that you assess your organization's readiness for change. And is there top management support? Do we have the right rewards and reinforcement systems in play? Uh, can, do we empower our employees? Uh, and do we give them time to work on innovations? And then do we remove barriers and boundaries that may impact their ability to be innovative? Uh, human re, human uh, high performance work systems um, are uh, critical to this whole implementation and creation of a humane entrepreneurial culture in an organization. Uh, Bolander and Snell suggested that high performance work systems result from speci specific combinations of HR practices, work structures, processes that, processes that maximize employee knowledge, skill, commitment, and flexibility. Our model categorizes these high performance work systems into three areas, knowledge management, comp and benefits, and policy and work design. Uh, knowledge management is uh, a key one. And here we're talking about uh, training, development, attracting competent employees and things like that. And it, there, a lot of work needs to be done in this area because we, we know that traditional selection and employee development uh, procedures don't always at attract the most innovative people. We'll talk about some more research by James Hayton down in a minute that really verifies that as well. Um, typical HR procedures tend to be job-based and look at people who will adhere to company policies and procedures, follow instructions and fit into the company profile. Well, if you study anything about creatives, they tend not to be these types of people. And so you're, you're kind of, uh, uh, not hiring the right people if you focus on this very straight line uh, HR path. Uh, little research though exists to better understand the requirements uh, and the impact of directly seeking creative and entrepreneurial employees. Uh, this is a, a gap in the research that needs to be addressed. Uh, there is a lot of discussion in the applied literature on what you should do. Uh, I call that armchair uh, research nothing wrong with it. And it, a lot of times it's written from experience, but we do need to empirically support some of these assertions. Uh, COP of benefits, most of the work basically focuses on reward systems like uh, incentives uh, and bonuses uh, uh, and the profit sharing and things like that. Uh, we also talk about the more intrinsic rewards like uh, feedback, better communication, uh, accomplishment of goals. Um, in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship, incentives should vary based on the need for incremental and radical innovations. And the research tends to show that. Incremental innovations are the fine tuning of things, the improvements, the better improving processes or products uh, may be more suited towards traditional incentives like uh, 
more flex time and autonomy or extrinsic rewards like bonuses, pay increases, profit sharing. But it's the radical innovations that are much more complicated. Uh, these incentives include things like organizational equity in the form of stock, stock options, even large equity stakes in a, in a venture spinoff. These though, companies are somewhat apprehensive to give. Uh, and so th those are uh, things that, again, another area of research, but we, we do understand, uh, Bugelstick uh, in 2008, in a study of Dutch firms found that incremental innovations are relatively easier to motivate with traditional HR practices where radical innovations are not. Uh, so uh, that's something that we need to work on if we want more radical innovations within our company. Uh, in terms of policies and work design, an entrepreneurial firm uh, should emphasize the design of policies and structures that enhance participation, open communication, and collaboration. Uh, you know, and this is what we get at in Humane Entrepreneurship and what Keishan talks about integration uh, of these humane practices. Uh, by, by enabling collaboration, open communication and these types of practices, we get to the, uh, we decrease impediments for entrepreneurial uh, initiatives. Hayton, uh, this study I mentioned before, uh, suggests that human resource management practice can either be traditional or discretionary. The traditional practices are the ones that we talked about before, defined jobs in terms of tasks, duties, responsibilities, structure rewards, and monitor individual performance like we traditionally do. Um, and these practices though are incongruent as we've suggested with creativity, innovation, risk-taking, uh, and activities required for innovation and entrepreneurship. He emphasizes discretionary HR and practices that focus on incentives and mechanisms that allow more knowledge sharing, encourage organizational learning, and uh, empowerment. He studied 99 small to medium uh, businesses, and he found that discretionary HR practices, uh, specifically discretionary behavior, knowledge sharing, and organizational learning, were positively related with innovative performance. It's, that's a great article, uh, Hayton in 2003, and I would recommend you go, go to that if you're really interested. Uh, so the idea then is these high performance work systems create human and social capital. And there's some good work done in this area. And, and, and I maintain and make the case that this is where the humane entrepreneurship is embedded. This is where it's actually, where a humane entrepreneurship culture is created. If you have high performance, employee-centered work systems that tie together goals of employees with goals of the company, then you can build the human and social capital. The social capital is the empathy, equity, and empowerment that we've talked about. And the human capital is the enablement. Uh, it's hiring competent employees and developing employees to be more competent and more successful and the focus on their development. Um, and so successful implementation then of high performance work systems will result in higher employee engagement with work and engagement with the firm's mission. And this is where the human entrepreneurship, humane entrepreneurship is created. I don't wanna talk a whole lot about uh, entrepreneurial orientation. It's been researched in many different ways, uh, but it really focuses on three aspects of, of behaviors within organizations, risk-taking, innovation, and proactiveness. And so we have to create a bias for, for these activities. And so when you have, uh, a, uh, you have a culture, the antecedents build a culture that supports corporate entrepreneurship. You create human re resource systems that, that are, are person-centric, but align with the goals of the organization. And then you, which creates the ability to act entrepreneurially, to take risks, to be innovative and proactive that's, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of that research, but um, leave it to say that there's plenty of things to read out there. But I do wanna mention Wales, Coven and Munson uh, just a year ago, highlighted three possible ways entrepreneurship as an organizational attribute can be discussed. They talked about top management style, leadership, and Keyshawn emphasized that this morning. Uh, our antecedents emphasize that. Configuration of key organizational elements that's what we bring in with this model, corporate 
on antecedents, work systems, and human and social capital. Uh, and so this is what we're trying to propose with the model. We're trying to suggest this may not be a, the perfect model yet, but uh, these are the linkages I think that we really have to build on. Um, our article has a summary of a lot of research that links high performance work systems and entrepreneur orientation research uh, to innovative performance. Uh, generally, the research suggests that there's positive relationships between these and innovative performance. However, my big point is to date, there is very little of any empirical research which, which ties humane entrepreneurship to other elements in the corporate entrepreneurship process. For humane entrepreneurship to continue, we hit and be a viable concept, we need to address that. You know, we have a lot of descriptive research, uh, some case study, but even that is very descriptive at this point. And we have to know that um, when we alter these humane entrepreneurship variables, uh, does, that, does that change organizational performance? Is it a moderator of performance? Is it a mediator of performance? We don't have the research uh, in, uh, to really address that at this point. I suggest that some research questions um, the, that center around uh, looking at high performance work systems and entrepreneurial orientation to interactive effects. How does that create humane entrepreneurship? How does that uh, create these elements of human and social capital? Uh, it, we, we have to have a foundation about where these come from and how we create them. Uh, we just can't say they exist. Um, a second research question look at, looks at organizational ambidexterity. It's the concept of having capabilities, opportunity identification, and knowledge integration at the same time. And that's really important as, as we develop uh, entrepreneurial organization. And the last question uh, is whether differentiating, differentiating HR structures help or hurt corporate entrepreneurship and its related outcomes. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, the model is, uh, is out there um, and open to all criticism, good and bad, uh, because I just, we just wanted to get something out there that would suggest a theoretical foundation and future research direction. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, very much. A really exceptional. Um, presentation here laying out more more kind of more foundation for the topic of humane entrepreneurship we have three or four minutes left before we switch here so i just want to follow up with a question for each of you here kind of get you to, to think about and to leave a message for everyone here so let me let me go back and start with david here and david the question that that came in the chat here is saying as you saw with humane entrepreneurship the defining it and then measuring it and then defining the, the, the impact of it is the challenges as we see in humane entrepreneurship. What about harmony and harmonious entrepreneurship? Well, how do you see that moving forward? You're on mute. Le, you're, let me, you're on mute, on mute. Okay. Hi, thanks, Eamon. Um, there's a question about how do um, employers see harmony? I don't think employers do. And one of the things that we've got to do is get people thinking much more holistically and um, getting them to understand that they, they certainly will not be able to survive in the coming environment unless they begin to pay attention to uh, the, the way the workforce is treated, and I, I endorse 100% the humane entrepreneurship approach, um, and, and pay attention to um, the environment and society. Uh, I think that this um, uh, um, pandemic has, has brought home to many, many people, certainly in the UK, uh, the, the damage that we are doing, be, have been doing to um, the uh, the, the planet. Um, what I want to see is, uh, I don't know if you know, but the Prince of Wales launched something called the Terra Carta at the um, One Planet Summit in January in Paris. And he's got a large number of um, corporates backing this and, and putting money in it. You know, 
what I want to see is those corporates actually doing something. You know, there's one thing, you know, taking out an insurance policy and um, backing the Prince of Wales, but I want to, I want to see them, you know, really addressing. And I, I'm working with um, a, a, a tourist organization at the present time. And, you know, what we're looking at is, can we actually develop a kite mark for harmonious tourism? You know, yep. measure some of the impact, the physical impact, um, and, and the, um, you know, not, not just measuring it on a global sense, but some of the local impacts as well in, in, in terms of tourism. Um, so you, you, we're working on that to try to get some, some sort of kite mark in place in the tourism sector. If we do that, then we'll roll it out to other sectors as well. Thank you, thank you very much. And Aliyah, I think you're the most plugged in knowledgeable people about all the hashtags here. My question to you is from all of them here and looking into the future, what do you think will be more focused or, or more coming up from all of them? What's your inclination or your feeling? I think you see the future to be honest with you. And I think the main challenge that we have in front of us that everything is changing more faster than ever, uh, than ever before. So right now, as a professor as well, uh, we're trying to create methods and to think in a model, but the reality is one model in three years is completely different. As a practitioner as well, I'm thinking how to think in a way more faster, um, more connected with the our communities, because uh, if we are all the time measuring things, the reality, for example, for, with Davos and all the conferences before uh, in January, before the pandemic last year, they thought a word that it changed, completely changed three months after that. So right now we have, in, in terms of reality and, and capacities and, uh, well, all the things are changing faster, so we need um, a fast. So we need to uh, to create a new model regarding from the universities connected more uh, connected more with the, the communities as well. And I think that's the main challenge that we have in front of us. How we think in universities for this century, given the the solutions that our students, our graduates need. Also, as uh, uh, Professor Dr. K uh, Kirby said, um, measuring and the real impact of the companies, if they are doing this in a holistic way, people-centered way, or it's only a marketing thing. It's only a, a thing that they are doing to get uh, more profits. So that's uh, the, the main thing that we need to, well, to create and to boost as, as professors as well, changing that. Thank you, Analia. And last question to Jeff, and it's a difficult question here, but humane entrepreneurship reminds me a lot with entrepreneurial orientation, the, the path that it's taking here and, and, and where we got here. My question to you, do you see humane entrepreneurship being mainstream like entrepreneurial orientation? And yes and or no, and why not? And let's do a quick gut reaction. Um, I, well, as it stands now, no. If we don't embed it within the theoretical framework suggested by our model or uh, somebody else, you know, somebody else with, and then test it with really good empirical research, it will not catch on in mainstream research. Uh, the the issue is is that I tried to embed it in creating human and social capital. There's some good research there, and there's some linkages there to EO. It's not the same as EO. Uh, I think it's the precursor to it. Um, that, that in order to have, create these macro organizational level things like risk-taking, practicalness, uh, and uh, uh, innovativeness, you need, to, you need to enhance your social and human capital. And I think if we can create that linkage, then we'll show an important element related to this humane entrepreneurship concept. Great, thank you. We're, we're, we're out of time. We have more sessions. I'm gonna put it here. So I invite you all to join us to the other sessions. If you go to the page, there's two other parallel sessions. So thank you, Professor Kirby, Professor Analia, and Jeff. Thank you so much, Professor Jeff. Thank you so much for coming, and I look forward to seeing you in the other session. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.